What is religion? First, a recap from last time. Do you remember the difference between theology and religious studies? Do you remember some different methods people have used when they've done religious studies? What does it mean to be reductive? Let's talk about some different definitions of the word religion. Last time, we discussed the question of how we're going to be studying. That is, we're doing religious studies, not theology. This time, we're going to ask what we're going to be studying. What is religion? And once again, it seems a lot easier than it really is. Religion is one of those categories that we use all the time. Whether you're religious or not, you probably think you know religion when you see it, right? Well, if you try to define the word religion, you realize it's not nearly as simple as it seems. Last time, we met Edward B. Tyler. He used evolutionary thinking to explain how religion slowly developed from what he called animism. So, for Tyler, Religion is just an evolved form of animism. Religion is the belief in spiritual beings. Religion is a belief in internal activity of thoughts and feelings, in spirits. Okay, so let's press that definition a little bit, shall we? First, this definition seems to be leaving some things out. For example, don't religions have rituals? Well, Tyler doesn't mention ritual. And don't religions have moral codes? Tyler doesn't mention those either. Ritual and morality, we could safely say, are rather central to religion, but Tyler sticks to belief alone. While I think we can agree believing in certain things is important to religion, doesn't religion have to have a public dimension too? In other words, religion's not just in people's heads, it involves certain kinds of actions like speech, practice, food and fasting, prayers, pilgrimages, or ethical behaviors. Religion isn't just what someone thinks, it's also what someone does, isn't it? Then there's this question of what is a spiritual being exactly? Now, I suppose we could say that spiritual beings means active agents other than those which are defined by our material sciences. So, things like souls, angels, gods, or demons, which people say act on the material world we live in, but don't fit into our biological categories, like plants, animals, fungi, or single-celled organisms. Okay, what about belief in ghosts? Can a person without religion believe in ghosts? What about aliens? Could a person without religion believe in aliens? Those kinds of non-biological beings, ghosts or aliens, are slightly harder to pin down as religious or not religious. Normally, for instance, we wouldn't call belief in aliens visiting Earth religion but they are active agents outside of our biological categories, so wouldn't they, if Tyler's definition is correct, constitute religion? But that doesn't seem right. And we can go one further. What if by spiritual being, Tyler means a transcendent agent? That is something that has no physical body, but still manages to act on our world. Well, that seems to work for a second. And then we notice that we have all sorts of beliefs in transcendent beings that we don't consider particularly religious. For instance, ideals, things like freedom or justice, are transcendent categories. They don't have a material body, yet often people will believe in them and believe that they're real. So is believing in the existence of justice religion? That sounds odd. And how about nation states or social groups? Is the belief in the existence of the United States religion? Now, normally we talk about the United States as a people or a place, not a religion. 
And in fairness, there are a specific group of people called Americans, but they're all incidental. The existence of the United States is not dependent on any one American existing, and indeed the first Americans are all long dead anyway. And then there's a place called the United States, but that place is also, strictly speaking, arbitrary. Exactly where the United States is has changed quite radically over the last two and a half centuries as the borders have moved. There is no place that has to be part of the United States, just like there is no person that has to be an American. But for the United States to exist, people need to believe it exists. There are certain thoughts and feelings about free government and laws that must be held by someone in order to say the United States exists. So does believing in the United States existence mean Americans are by definition religious? Most of us would say no, but Tyler's definition suggests yes. So this definition of religion applies to things that we wouldn't call religion. The issue with Tyler's definition is it's too vague and maybe even a little circular. Belief doesn't tell us much because be people believe in all sorts of things. Likewise, apparently important aspects of religion, like practice and morality, aren't addressed here at all. And the phrase spiritual beings could include any number of things which we wouldn't consider religious. In fact, the phrase spiritual beings, as Tyler is using it, is probably just a byword for the kind of beings religious people believe in. In other words, Tyler's definition assumes that you know what religion is when you see it, and so this isn't a very useful definition, because in a certain sense, he's just swapping out the word religious with the word spiritual. Let's try another definition, also from a scholar of religion that we've met already. Here's a definition used by Emil Durkheim. Remember that he's a sociologist, right? everything's about societies, who says that there is an instinctive human differentiation between the profane and the sacred. He says, A religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, that is to say, things set apart and forbidden, beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community called the church, all those who adhere to them. Now, off the bat, we can see that Durkheim's definition is much more detailed than Tyler's, which is good, because we noticed that Tyler was a little too generic and vague. But let's break down what Durkheim is actually saying, though. A religion is a unified system, which suggests a complicated order of things which somehow fit together into coherent whole, fine, of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things. So, unlike Tyler, Durkheim includes practices, not just beliefs. Well, that's something. But then we hit this phrase, sacred things, which he even qualified for us as things set apart and forbidden. This sounds good for a moment, but then we realize there are lots of things that are set apart and forbidden that we wouldn't call sacred. Someone who's imprisoned by her society is set apart and forbidden, but that doesn't mean prisoners are sacred. Like Tyler's phrase, spiritual beings, Durkheim's sacred things presupposes something in us. He presupposes that there is an innate difference between sacred and profane in everyone, at all times, and we all know about it. In other words, when Durkheim says that a religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, he is kind of just saying that religions have beliefs and practices regarding religious stuff. It's circular just like Tyler's definition. Then look at the last part of the definition. Beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community called the church, all those who adhere to them. This presupposes a lot too. First, it's specific to just one particular religion, Christianity. Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, and Taoism don't have churches. And even if we ignore the problem of applying the word church on non-Christians, there are still more problems even for those who actually use that word. There are lots of Christians, both now and in the past, and they haven't always agreed on what the church is, or even if there's only one of them. 
there are literally thousands of groups of people who call themselves Christians and refer to their communities as churches. And there's nothing that we can say about all of them that they all have in common. What unifies them? Many of these groups have shared beliefs and practices, sure, but what is it that unites them all without exception? Well, you can say Christians believe in God, sure, but lots of people who don't call themselves Christians believe in God. Christians believe that a certain man named Jesus is a spiritual leader called the Messiah or the Christ. Sure they do. But Muslims and Rastafarians believe that too, and they don't call themselves Christians. Now, we can keep going on like this, but in the end, the definition is always going to be circular. The definition will always presuppose that you already understand that there's a category called religion, that you understand what that word means, and that you can identify an example of religion called Christianity or church. And then we come back to the problem of those phenomena that fit this definition, but that we don't call religion, like the United States. One of the shortcomings of Tyler's definition of religion is that it applies to the belief in the existence and power of an unseen transcendent reality called the United States. Well, the same thing happens with Durkheim's definition of religion. The United States is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, that is to say, things set apart and forbidden. Beliefs and practices which unite into one single moral community, called the Church, all those who adhere to them. Now, just like we know that there are religions that don't have churches, let's ignore that in this case, too. So, is the United States a unified system of beliefs and practices? Yes, Americans believe, or are supposed to believe, in the laws of their nation, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. They practice those beliefs in courtrooms, elections, and Fourth of July celebrations, all of which are particularly ritualistic. Those beliefs and practices are relative to sacred things, like, for instance, the universal rights of individuals, or freedom of speech and the press. And those things are set apart and forbidden. Right? They can't be taken away without due process. And these moral things unite those who believe and practice them into one single community called the nation, the United States. So, is it possible to define religion in such a way that it does not presuppose what religion is, rely on vague terminology or synonyms for religion, like sacred or spiritual, and cannot apply to anything which your average English speaker wouldn't call a religion? It's tricky and a little infuriating because religion seems so obvious. We talk about and identify things as religious all the time, don't we? So why is this so tricky? Why does religion presuppose that we know what it is? Why does it seem at once so obvious and yet so vague? And why does it overlap with other phenomena that we don't call religion? The history of the word religion. The problem presents itself more clearly when we look at the history of the word religion. The word religion tries to explain a vast number of radically different thoughts, beliefs, actions, and actors across human history. Nearly all of it. Religion is trying to contain phenomena from essentially every society that ever existed, most of which have nothing to do with each other. What does the Hawaiian belief in the goddess Pele have to do with a Zen Buddhist meditation on the emptiness of all beings? And what do either of those have to do with Mormons knocking on people's doors? The first scholars of religious studies, people like Tyler and Durkheim, tried so hard to find one definition of religion to explain all these phenomena that they cast their nets a little too wide. They created definitions of religion that are vague enough to apply in almost any context. But then the natural side effect of that is that the definition is going to apply to all sorts of non-religious phenomena. Religion was drawn so big that it overlapped with all sorts of other things. Following the turn to contextualization in the second half of the 20th century, 
scholars of religion started to understand why this problem persisted. The most noteworthy of these was Wilfred Cantwell Smith. In his 1963 book, The Meaning and End of Religion, Smith outlined a massive problem in the study of religion as a category. Those older scholars of religion thought that religion was sui generis, meaning that it was a unique class of phenomena. To say religion is sui generis is to claim religion is utterly, naturally distinct from other things like politics, science, art, and history. But Smith and many other scholars pointed out rightly that this isn't the case, because most cultures and most times and most places have no notion of religion at all. Religion is an invention of Western culture, and religion isn't even that old of an invention. Allow me to explain. It's a little complicated. There is no word in any pre-modern language that behaves like the word religion. Not anywhere. Only modern Western culture and those people who have had long contact with the modern West have a notion like religion. For example, we could say that the ancient Greeks had a religion, but there's no way to translate that thought into classical Greek. There is no word in ancient Greek for Greek religion, because the ancient Greeks had no notion of religion. Now, this may seem a little odd if you know anything at all about the ancient Greeks. Right? You might know that some of them worshipped gods like Athena or Zeus, and then later there were Greek-speaking Jews and Christians who believed in a certain Middle Eastern god too. And those Greeks had rituals involving all these gods. They had moral codes which they claimed were in accord with these gods, and that's all true. But they had no concept called religion that was distinct from other concepts like politics or law. Now, the reason this is confusing is we translate ancient writings in Greek into modern languages, and so sometimes we translate certain Greek words as religion. So it can seem like people who spoke ancient Greek had a notion of religion, but they didn't. Here's just one example from a letter called James, which is now found in the Christian Bible. It was written in the first century in Greek. In translation, it says, The religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The word here translated as religion is triskeia, and in modern Greek, triskeia does indeed mean religion. But in the ancient world, triskeia means something like ritual or rite, something you do in a systematic way for a greater good. But unlike the modern word religion, triskeia does not suggest a belief system or a unified group of people who believe in it. And sure enough, when you look back at this passage, it doesn't say anything about a group of adherents to anything or a belief system. It's talking about certain activities that you should do over and over again because God wants you to. Care for the needy and help keep yourself unpolluted by the world. What about other ancient languages? In Arabic, we find the word deen. And if you asked an Arabic speaker today what deen means, she would probably say something like religion. And in modern Arabic, that's entirely correct. But that is because modern Arabic has been in contact with Westerners for several centuries, and those Westerners have a notion called religion. This ancient word, deen, now means religion, just like the Greek word, triskeia, now means religion too. The word deen in Arabic didn't always mean that. So, for instance, let's look at the Quran, where the word deen is often translated into English as religion. You will not worship what I worship. You have your religion, and I have my religion. Now again, the translation seems to make sense. The verses are paralleling two thoughts. What you worship is your deen, and what I worship is my deen. Right? And the English word for worshipping something usually involves religion, right? 
Now, let's look at another passage that's also from the Quran. It uses the same word, deen. Master of the day of deen, it is you that we worship. Both of these passages use the word deen. They're both from the same book, the Quran, and both of them are talking about worshiping things. But if we try to translate this second passage with the word religion, it makes no sense. What is the day of religion? The problem here is that the word deen doesn't mean religion, because there is no ancient Arabic word like religion. The word deen actually means repayment or recompense. Deen is something you do to repay a debt you owe to someone or something. So, in the second Quranic passage here, it's saying that the speaker is a worshiper of God, who is the master of the day on which people will be repaid for what they've done. That is, judgment day, at the end of time, the day of repayment. God is the judge of people's actions, and so God is the master of the day of repayment. Then go back to the previous passage. It isn't saying, you have your religion and I have my religion. It's saying, you have your way of trying to repay your debt to God, and I have my way of trying to repay my debt to God. Again, the notion is that there is an ancient word for religion, but that's just an illusion created by translation. Another example. In ancient India, there is the Sanskrit word dharma, which is sometimes translated today as religion. And like religion, the word dharma can mean a moral code. Many Hindus or Buddhists would call their moral systems their dharma. Dharma can also refer to the teachings of a certain person, like the Buddha. So the Buddhists would talk about the dharma of the Buddha. But the word dharma literally means a support, something that holds something else together. So we can also talk about dharma as the order of the universe. You can't really do that with the word religion, right? For example, in the Hindu epic poem, the Bhagavad Gita, which was written in Sanskrit sometime around the 5th century before the Christian calendar began, it starts with a famous line that gives us the setting of the story. On the field of Dharma, on the field of the Kuru clan. Now, on the field of Dharma does not mean on the field of religion. Instead, the story is taking place in the material universe, on a certain piece of land controlled by a particular family called the Kuru clan. So the field of Dharma means a place in our historical reality where everything is governed by certain physical and moral laws. In other words, the story isn't happening in some faraway transcendent realm of spirits. The word religion, of course, doesn't behave like this at all. Now we can keep going, but I think three examples there is enough. But what about our concept of religion? Where does that even come from then? If there's no ancient equivalent to it, how do we have this word religion? Now, there is an ancient Latin term called religio, which by the way doesn't mean religion either. Religio can refer to anything that is just done over and over again in a particular way. but it can also refer to a certain scruple or custom that has nothing to do with worshiping anything. Right? It's just something you do over and over again. And we still have a survival of this, by the way, in modern English. If you say, she reads the newspaper religiously, you aren't saying she has a deep-seated moral or theological feeling about the newspaper, or is attributing some transcendent meaning to the newspaper. If she reads the newspaper religiously, it just means she reads it in a particular, usually serious way, over and over again. Say, each morning at 7 a.m. in silence with a cup of black coffee. So a religio just means something customary, and not necessarily something we would call religious. Now that started to change in the early modern period. At that time, Western Europe was undergoing a huge transformation. And one part of that transformation is what's called the Protestant Reformation. It was a huge and complicated process, but to make it as simple as possible, it was an argument about whether a Christian just needed to believe certain things, or needed to practice very particular rituals as well as having those beliefs. 
those Christians called Protestants broke away from the Catholic Church in part anyway, because they argued that Catholics were too reliant on rituals and not enough on personal beliefs alone. While the Protestants didn't deny that Christians had to actually do certain things, faith and belief should have priority. Personal belief and faith was the most important practice, the most important religio. In Protestant Christianity, then, we see the first appearance of that particular combination of beliefs, activities, and community that called itself religion. In time, both sides of the conflict, both Protestants and Catholics, started talking about their given worldviews in ways that approached the ways that we use the word in English today, the word religion. Because they differed about the exact role of beliefs, thoughts, practices, ethics, and community, they were saying they differed over religion. And they even called their era's political conflicts the wars of religion. Most significantly, though, peoples who used religion in this way didn't stay put in Western Europe. Protestants and Catholics, with this distinctive category called religion, conquered most of the known world in the early modern period. And wherever they went, they brought the category of religion with them. Even in the early modern period, for a long time, religion only referred to Christianity. For example, here's a line from the Journal of Christopher Columbus. Here he is, describing the native inhabitants of the island of Hispaniola, the people called the Taino, in his entry for October 11, 1492. In other words, he's writing just before the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, which would begin 25 years later, in 1517. I am of opinion that the Taino people would very readily become Christians, as they appear to have no religion. Is he saying that the Taino people have no beliefs, moral codes, spiritual powers, or ritual practices? No. All he's saying is that the Tainos aren't Christians. As the long global history of colonization and empires continued, people who had this particular notion of Christianity and religion encountered more and more and more people, and they needed to explain what these people were like using their own European languages. That is to say, religion was starting to break away from a particular Christian notion of Western Europeans, and was becoming a category of which Christianity was just one example. This started with those non-Christian peoples who lived in or very near to Western Europe, who the colonizers would have encountered by far the most. So, for another example, in 1614, Edward Brerwood said that there were only four religions in the world, Christianity, Mohammedanism, Judaism, and idolatry. Notice that of these four, only one refers to what people would have called themselves. In 1614, no one called themselves Mohammedans, Jews, or idolaters. Well, obviously idolater is problematic because it's an insult. Nobody calls herself an idolater because that implies she worships something false or evil, like an idol. And no one calls themselves a Mohammedan either. However, Western Europeans have had a long history of thinking that Muslims worshipped the Prophet Muhammad, and so in the Middle Ages, they mistakenly started calling them Mohammedans. Indeed, this error continued well on into the 20th century. Interestingly, the name Jews and Judaism stuck and were in time used by those people to talk about themselves. But before the modern period, these people called themselves Hebrews, Israelites, or Judeans. There's no pre-modern word that means Judaism or even Jew. Those are modern Christian words developed by modern people who had the notion of religion. And as the centuries rolled on, Western colonizers developed more and more and more examples of religion, usually inventing new words to label these groups. Applying the common European suffix, ism, meaning a worldview or an ideology, 
the term Hinduism first appeared in 1787. The word Buddhism didn't appear until 1801. Taoism, Confucianism, Sikhism, Paganism, all of these come from modern Europeans, even though they often refer to very ancient or very non-European things. And this is why trying to find a useful definition for the word religion is so hard. It's not a sui generis category at all. It's an outside category, which is relatively new. It wasn't designed to talk about people living in the ancient world, nor was it designed for people living outside of Western Europe. And so most of the times, and in most situations, something called religion is just going to be a bit like a bad translation. It's sort of like calling hieroglyphs emojis, or calling illustrated manuscripts comic books. It's not exactly wrong, but it isn't exactly right either. Well, so what? Well, now we have a huge problem. How can we offer a scientific, historical study of a phenomena like religion? The very label religion is an outside imposition by modern Christians. Pre-modern Christians, and most everyone else everywhere who ever lived, wouldn't recognize this category called religion, so how can we gauge it in them? How can we study a human phenomena when those humans themselves, the ones we're studying, don't know what we're talking about? How can we study the world's religions when, for most of the world, most of the time, there's no notion of religion to speak of? Here's some more things to think about before you come to class. Why is defining religion so difficult? Is religion a sui generis category? Where did the notion of religion come from? This lecture was based on the following works. First, as mentioned above, is Wilfred Cantwell Smith's The Meaning and End of Religion, 1963. Also check out Jonathan Z. Smith's famous essay called Religion, Religions, Religious in the book Critical Terms for Religious Studies, edited by Mark C. Taylor, 1998. If you want to see how each different religion came to be so labeled in European languages, look at The Invention of World Religions by Tamako Mazuzawa, 2005. And for a very readable overview of all this, see Brent Nagri's Before Religion, A History of a Modern Concept, 2013.